היי יוכבד, מה נשמע? בסדר, מה שלומך? ברוך השם. You can hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good, because I'm using like a different uh, device. All right, אני מתנצלת, אני אוכלת ארוך צהריים. That's why it's called lunch and learn. <laughs> right? It's supposed mm-hmm. to be that. Mm-hmm. You can actually justify the title. Yeah. I'm drinking. We took, um, so Yaakov has been away for four weeks. We are, yeah. We're in the States or somewhere else? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he was all over. The, like he was in Houston for a few days. Mm-hmm. And the uh, Denver, California. Most mm-hmm. of the He was with his parents, but doing a lot of jobs there. So it's really, when the kids are, when he's away, it's really hard on the kids. The little ones miss him a lot. So we said, but when he comes back, we'll go away one day to the beach. Because mm-hmm. I'm scared like this. I don't drive on highways in Israel. No? I didn't really, no. I'm not comfortable. <laughs> So I like, yeah. I manage, because everything is in Beit Shemesh. I never really have to leave. Everything is Kupat Cholim, all my doctors, the kids' schools, Chugim, and all that. So uh, I kind of wait for him to come, because I, I don't feel like schlepping. Even though I yeah. took my kids once to the beach when he was there. There is here. a train. There's such thing called as a train. You know what? There's a, there's a train in Beit Shemesh. My kids now. love the train. They're, okay, they, so. The thing is, the train doesn't really get 100% there. You got to take another bus from there. But the trains, you've seen the trains in Israel, they're very nice. Yeah, the I know. Ben- the Benny Oni trains have like little tables. You could charge your, it's very nice. They have restrooms. I mean, it's nice. It's a nice experience. I so love today- driving in Israel, except I don't go into Tel Aviv. I'll park outside of Tel Aviv or in, or in a parking lot uh-huh. in there. Because it's hard to find parking. And that's yeah. it. But every, wow. and Ramad Gan, I don't like going to Ramad Gan either. Yeah. Only because of parking. Wow. But you otherwise, I, I can go. Hates, and... Yaakov hates parking in Jerusalem. It's very difficult also. I wouldn't drive in Jerusalem. I'd go to the wrong side of the, the, the neighborhood. Yeah. I'd be afraid. Wow. Yeah. Wow. How is, but... who's taking care of your apartment? Like you have neighbors? Nobody. The brother call... by it. The Vada buy it. I gave her a key to my apartment to go in and check it. I closed the water. I closed, oh, okay, that's good. Uh, everything's closed oh, except just... the electric. The water. And what else did I close? The gas. That's all Yeah, closed. that's good. She's, she's getting my mail and putting it in my apartment. And she's going in to make sure everything's fine. And that's it. You don't leave, you didn't leave plants or anything? No, because of the, I had, someone gave me a plant. Said, Why do you give me a plant? You know, I don't. I'm leaving. Yeah. So I gave it yeah. to my sister. I gave it to my sister to hold it for me till I get back. She says, if I get right. still alive. What do you prefer now that you're living here and there? You're feeling, where do you feel better? I listen. It, when I made Aliyah and came back for the first time, it was very difficult for me. I couldn't wait to go back to Israel. I'm fine. When I'm in Israel, I completely forget about the States. And when yeah. I'm in the States, I don't forget about Israel, but I, I don't, I'm just used to it. I'm, I, I'm in both places because I have my you own have place like, here. You have like full houses in both places. You yes, have- complete, it's all, my, it's all my stuff. When I came wow. here, when I came to California, because I lived in California for 13 years. Anyway, so wow. when I, came to California from Israel. We left everything in Israel. I told my husband, I'm not packing up. Oh, I'm leaving the house as it is. I cannot leave Israel, period. So everything stayed. So we came with four suitcases and that wow. was it. And we bought everything new. And then and so everything I have here. Right. And I have right, Israel. You wow. <laughs> yeah. Rosalie, how are you? Where's Myra? Just sending her a text message uh, that to awesome. remind her because when I came on, I saw she wasn't here. Are you back so, in Houston or still in New York? Actually, I'm in New York. I'm in well, I'm in Cedarhurst. I'm in the five towns right now with my. Nice. With the, I saw you were in a marathon, right? I wasn't in the marathon. Gosh, I wish I was in such good shape, but I did watch it, the New York marathon. Oh, I saw pictures of it. I thought you were part of it. Wow, that's so cool. I was an I was a I was a cheerleader. <laughs> I love it. That's the best. You mean yeah. your who, your fiance? Who was it? Who was running actually? 
Oh, uh, my friend, Dr. Mindy Carson's husband, Noel Meltzer, uh, nice. was uh, running. It was his sixth uh, New York marathon. He's 67 wow. years old and he ran his first one when he was 60 and he's run every year since. Wow, it gives and, hope because I'm so out of right. shape. <laughs> and then my daughter-in-law yeah. had a friend who was running and I was wow. videotaping it and I was getting it towards the, toward, at, finally I was like, it had been videotaping it for a while. I decided I'm going to turn it off. And when I turned it off, I caught the bottom feet and the shorts of her of her friend who was running because wow. i didn't know what he looked like and it just so happened that he ran by right as i was turning it off so that's i was so like funny. going down like that and that's so funny and so she recognized the shoes and the he was wearing these <laughs> blue blue shoes and this orange orange running shorts so from funny. behind it was even from behind it wasn't even from the front so so funny so yeah it was, was. Still, myra is in houston now my in Houston Houston right now. Yeah. And there were 33,000 people that were running. That's wow. what's so funny that of all the, that I happened to catch him. And so that is like what we call I it. I just randomly, randomly. Right, that's, like that's like Providence. That's like Providence. so and amazing. We, we, were, we weren't standing right next to each other because it was, uh, there was a line, uh, a police line, and uh, we had to stand b behind the, the ribbon. So we were standing a few people away. So I didn't hear her when she said that it was her friend. I forgot his name, Gary, whatever his name was. So yeah. Nice. Are you staying with friends in Cedarhurst? I'm staying with Isaac and Dina. Uh, oh, Sarah cool. uh, And Sarah's here also. And so the nice. two grandchildren. Oh my God, they're so gorgeous. So cute. Myra's, Myra's kids. When is, oh, when is Myra's? When is Mara supposed to fly to this? I know she's flying back. When is she supposed to be flying? Right before Thanksgiving, the week of the week of Thanksgiving. Oh, right. Sarah, and... yeah, Sarah had to come back. Yeah, Sarah's still She originally was friends. going to be here now, but I had already made my plans. And so Dina and Isaac said that I was welcome to come and stay awesome. um, a couple of days by myself with them. And then still... Um, then I'll leave and Myra will come in about Wait, two Myra weeks. still goes for like, she started going and working from there, right? Right, right. Because she's working Zoom. She can work anywhere. That's so wonderful. Uh, she's supposed yeah. to come. It, Hashem, she's supposed to come with me to Israel after Pesach. So first I, want, I, have, I have to finish my doctors. And if everything is fine, then I will get tickets to come to Israel after Pesach. Nice. And then she can work from Israel. That's, That's wonderful. So Let me connecting. send her a text. We're all chatting about her. Let me, I was getting, I, I had it to <laughs> yeah. send her. Let me send it. To I'm going to send a reminder on the group that I'm doing this. I just don't know where I put my phone. <laughs> so we did, we took the kids today to Rishon Lezion to the beach. And it's so insane. It's November. I and know. It's supposed to be, well, it's supposed no, to be getting cold. It's a little cold in November. Usually it doesn't get cold until January. But it changes, no. you never know. No, November last year was very cold. I, I don't know. I, rem I remember working in school in yeah. when I was working as a teacher, September, October, November, it was still hot. It is so hot. Like but last it year, it's been a, no, today at the beach, it was in the 80s. I was like, yeah, wow. I know. It's, yeah, I know. But usually it's I think so in January, it starts getting. Uh, oh, I know. I'm, I'm kind of like cool. not a and so I love love as long as we could stretch summer and it's nice because it's not too too hot you it's know? not it's not the summer that's summer it's without the look exactly. and it's pleasant exactly. and yeah. you got the cold breeze it's very yeah, it's like us fall yeah the guy might. so I know yeah. that someone couldn't make Tuesday and I'm going to record it and I'm going to mm -hmm. on the group I'm going to mm -hmm. wait for Rosalie to come back I'm just going to run and get my phone and just to remind people that I'm on, um, and we'll start. I'm not going to wait longer because we'll and, just. And also, Devor, please remember to add Myra when you get a chance during oh, the. Oh, I added her today. I did. I oh, perfect, her. perfect. I can hear you. I'm just typing. I have to pick up all my three grandchildren. 
my daughter had to go to the dentist. She's having a problem with her teeth. And I said, just go to the dentist. Don't wait for the phone call. Just go and sit there oh. until, they until they take care of her. Oh. Yeah. What's, no. wrong, with her, what's wrong with her? I don't uh, know. She's doing root canal. And in Israel, when she did her last root canal, it was a nightmare for her. And she says, Mom, I'm going. I have the same nightmare. So I said, just go to the, she's in bad pain. And I said, go to the dentist and just sit there until he takes you. Yeah, and they'll have it. to take her, you know? And okay. that's it. I said, just go, wait, that. she's in really bad pain. I said, just go there and wow. uh, I'll take care of the kids. I have to pick up three kids from three different schools. Oh, she's so lucky that you're there. I, My, you know, I she needs, yeah. Your grandchildren, yeah. you're so cute. Yeah. It's a boy. I have my, my I see a wind, picture of a boy. My daughter sent me a picture of um, a video of the in Germany, and it was so cute. <laughs> the baby's put something. He's eating already. He's six months old. He's eating regular food and sitting in wow. a high chair. And then so he puts it on the floor. So the little one says, "Maze, maze, lo, lo, simese." The kid. They speak Hebrew to their kids. And then she switches to German. So I said to my daughter. We're gonna start translating because I have no idea what you said. Bitte, bitte, I bitte. Oh my gosh, that's hysterical. It was so cute. And no, when it was didn't. in Hebrew, she was like very stern, mamash. And yeah. then, and then uh, when she switched to German, she was sweet. <laughs> Do they have? They go to a gun. She goes to a gun. That's She's English. going to an international in English and German. Oh. No, uh, she understands so English. My daughter speaks to her. My daughter speaks to her in three languages. Her husband speaks to her in one in Hebrew, maybe German. The, her metaplot are Israeli, so she gets Hebrew. Wow. My daughter wow. speaks to her in three languages in one sentence, English, Hebrew, and German. I don't know how you do that. So the baby speaks yeah. English, Hebrew, and German in one sentence. That is so amazing. That is so incredible. Wow. Yeah. I'm so upset with that. Like, my kids are upset with me because... They're like, you should have spoken Hebrew to us, but I really just couldn't. I was I, I No, you, you, you know, I didn't. I didn't. My husband always spoke. Oh, we always spoke English in the house. My yeah. husband didn't speak Hebrew with, to them. Only when we moved down back to Israel in 1993, then my husband started speaking to them in Hebrew because one was in one was going into, you know, she was 18. The other one was going into high school and the other one was going into junior high, ele soft elementary school. So wow. then he started speaking to them in Hebrew. But before that, no, my kids yeah. knew Hebrew. The older, they were, they were in Israel since they were two and, and five and four and a half. The yeah, yeah, other know, I, was parented, I was parented in English. Oh, uh, yeah. In Israel, but I was parented in English. So yeah. it was natural for me to talk to my kids in Hebrew. We have yeah. Lily on. Welcome, Lily. Okay, so I'm going to start. I'm going to do quick uh, touching on Parsha, and we're going to continue into this week's Parsha. Last week's Parsha, we were introduced to Rebecca, Rivka, Imenu. I love this chumash because we're learning about the matriarchs. So we learned about Sarah and Sarah's life and Sarah's death and, and the eulogy of Abraham and Abraham's love and the great loss that that happened to him when he he lost uh, lost Sarai Menu. Then we're introduced to Rebecca. Eliezer goes, you know, to seek for a wife, and he brings her into the tent, and she is totally carrying the torch of the legacy of Sarah. Because when she walks into the tent, all the blessings that happened to Sarah are continuing with her. She's very much an embodiment and a continuity to Sarah. And um, Yitzchak is in love with her. He's like, wow, Baruch Hashem, I found someone that's going to carry on the Sarah message, right? Because his mom was a real pioneer. It's not, it wasn't trendy to believe in a one God. They were like very unpopular and hated. And it wasn't the thing to, to believe in. And Baruch Hashem, he saw that Rivka embodied and resembled his mom so much. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Rivka, things that I'm not sure I mentioned last week. And then this week's Parsha, we're getting introduced to Rachel and Leah, right? So we have the four matriarchs. 
So we're going to see what the qualities of, of Rivka, because we already spoke about Sarah, and the unique qualities of Lea and Rachel. We're going to talk about the switch and what really happened there and why are Rachel's tears so unique. Okay, so um, Rivka, this is wild. I, I was reading that Rivka was actually a Gilgul, a reincarnation of Chava. And Yaakov was a reincarnation of Adam. <coughs> and Asab was reincarnation of, who's the third character in that story of Garden of Eden? The evil dude, the snake, the serpent. And this time around, Rivka, she goes out of her comfort zone, what we, what we learned last week. And she creates what we call the switch, the switch of the blessings, the stolen blessings. And why? Because she knows that if chas v'shalom, the blessings of the physical world, the, mater the materialistic blessings of the world are given to Esav, that it would be, it's like giving them like the power, the nuclear power to evil people. Like that's why we're fighting so hard against Iran, right? In many ways, I don't know if you see the news, but Israel's always concocting ways to shut down and slow down their nuclear powers. Like we've messed with their computer programs. And there's a lot of things they attribute to Israel that I'm not even so sure that it's Israel, but whatever, we'll take the claim. Um, so she knew that it would be so dangerous. Yitzchak on the other hand, it was a, an, they had an argument, an ideological debate. He, he knew that Yaakov was Tzadik. He did know that. He was a prophet, he knew, even though he was blind. and. He knew that Esav tzayed b'fiv, like he was like a swindler with his mouth. And he wasn't such a good guy. He knew it. But he felt that if Yaakov got the blessing of the physical world, it would distract Yaakov from carrying on the legacy of Avram Yitzchak Yaakov. Yitzchak knew that Yaakov is his heir. He's going to be the one carrying his legacy. He understood that Esav was, so to say, the fallout, right? Kind of like what Avram had. He had Ishmael, you know? So, but Rivka said it would be too dangerous. If, if the blessings are given to Yaakov, he will share it with his brother. So what happened here is a reenactment of what happened in the Garden of Eden, where when Chava had interaction, she was engaging with the snake, with the serpent. It was, it was boundaries that were blurred. It was not okay. And that's what kind of led to the sin of eating from the tree of good and evil because she started engaging with conversation with them and he started persuading her and tempted her and basically got her to sin and eat from that tree. <coughs> this time around, she's a reincarnation of Chava. Rivka is like, I must make sure that the blessings are not taken away from Adam, meaning Yaakov, right? Because he is a reincarnation the, Kabbalic, uh, the Kabbalistic masters are telling us he's a reincarnation of Adam. And I must make sure that the blessings don't go, that this nuclear power doesn't go to the serpent, doesn't go to the Nachash, because she gave him too much power, right? Too much consideration in the, in the first story, in the Garden of Eden. So, <clears throat> so she's doing the tikkun here. And it's not a simple thing for her to do. Because as we know, the dynamics between Yitzchak and Rivka was she was always very timid and shy from him and respected every word he said, looked up to him. She was much younger than him. But she, this is what's so beautiful about the matriarchs. They took charge when it was necessary to take charge. And she felt that this was going to be spiritually wrong. We spoke about this last week that the matriarchs and the patriarchs were very futuristic. Like unlike when you're looking at two schools of thought, like Freud is always like, let's talk about the past, your trauma, your parents, let's blame it all on your past and why you're stuck where you are right now. And, and Judaism, like it's more futuristic, the patriarchs and the matriarchs always thought, like, like Avraham just lost his wife, Sarah, and right away he's engaged a minute after he gets up from Shiva, we got to marry Yitzchak because someone is going to carry on the legacy of my spirituality. So he has to set up the future of the nation because he's the foundation. So the, the, the matrix and the patriarchs are also, always, always thinking of a bigger picture. It's not just like, 
oh, right now I don't feel like doing this. It's not comfortable for me to stand up to Yitzchak. She knew she had to for history's sake. She did not want to repeat mistakes that happened in the history and God forbid would continue. So um, she does the tikkun in this time around. Now, I was reading something. It's so beautiful. The Midrash calls Rivka. She's like a, a rose among thorns. She comes from such a messed up, dysfunctional, mafiosis kind of family, you know? And she is like basically the symbol of triumph over your negative environment. So you can never blame your environment. Say, oh, I grew up in a dysfunctional home or I'm not in a place of Torah. So therefore I can't really go right now because I'm isolated, I'm this, I'm that, I'm in quarantine or whatever. No excuses. Rivka grew up with really bad people, swindlers, crooks, and she herself, you know, overcame it, seek spirituality, married Yitzchak, left her family, moved to Israel, right? And is always engaged in making sure that the legacy of Sarah, right? Because she embodied Sarah. All the miracles that happened to Sarah happened to her and that that gets carried on. What's interesting is when she was pregnant, the Midrash describes that also the Chumash, the Pshat, that she that the boys were very active inside of her and it caused her tremendous pain. What was the pain? It was an anguish. She would go by idol wor- a house of idol worship, Esav wanted to come out. And Yaakov, when she would go by a house of Torah, Yaakov wanted to come out. And she's like, what is going on here? And then when shame tells her, you have two nations within you, she was consoled. How did that console her? She was still carrying someone. She was told by shame that he is not a good person, that he is not going to be the heir of Abraham and Yitzchak, that he's able to say the fallout. So you should know that all her life, the Midrash describes the fact that she had a lot of guilt. She always felt, and she was very jealous of Sarah, said, how did Sarah, she was able to like husk away like the purity of Abraham and have Yitzchak. Whereas Hagar, she had Yishmael out of, out of Abraham. They say that that was the, the part of Abraham, his DNA that came from Terach. His father was the master of idol worship. You remember the Midrash tells us that he had a, a storefront for idol worship. You know, it's like uh, there's Toys R Us. It was Idols R Us, you know. That was Avraham's dad's store. He manufactured idols. And Avram came from that, yet became monotheistic and brought the message of Hashem into the world. Yet because of that, so to say like there was that DNA in him, it came out like Hagar took that away. And Sarah was able to just have Yitzchak. And, and Rivka said, oh my gosh, I can't believe that I couldn't just receive the purity out of Yitzchak. Like she always felt guilty, like it was her background and environment caused her to have an Asa, you know? And, and she was devastated by it. But then when shame says to her, the Midrash tells us, he says there are going to be two nations, but don't worry. Yehuda Hanasi, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi from the Talmud is going to be the descendants of Yaakov. And Antoninus is going to be descendant of Esav. And when she heard that, she said, okay, I could breathe. And the Midrash also tells us that the sons of Esav sit today in Bnei Brak. Esav became the descendants of Esav or Haman, Haman. <laughs> and then his descendants are sitting somewhere in Bnei Brak, they say, learning Torah today. So when she, who was Antoninus? He was the, the Caesar of Rome. And he converted to Judaism. He was very close with, Antoni, with Rabbi Yehuda Anasi from the Talmudic era. And <laughs> what was so beautiful, they formed a friendship and Antoninus uh, converted. So she said, you know what? Even if out of evil spark will come out good in the end, I could live with the fact of being Asaph's mom, right? And also it's a big message for life that sometimes this was her destiny to have Yaakov and to have Asaph. We have different kinds of kids, you know? And we might say, wait, why didn't I get like just the Yaakov type or the Yitzchak type of that? And it gives you like a, a wild type, like Ishmael, you know, or whatever. <laughs> you have a situation in life that, that is not exactly what you wanted, you know? 
This is not what I asked for. I wanted only to have a Yaakov, and Hashem gives you a Yaakov. And a... We don't really have uh, control over like what's going to, you know, what's destined to us. So we're going to see this also a little later. We have what is our choice, what we want, right? I want, I want, I want this. I want a good life, a stress-free life. I don't want to have diseases. I don't want to, I want all my kids to walk in the path of Hashem. I want, I want a lot of things. And then there is, that's my choice, what I want. And then there is what's fated to us, meaning fate de and destined for us. And, um, and so this was like the big message for Rivka, like you have to accept this. And there's a reason for this tikkun to happen, you know, and that this is the way that Hashem orchestrated it to happen. Um, so she said, even if out of an evil, like in this, in this evil, there's a spark of holiness. So she, she said, I could live with it. So meaning to know that not everything that looks evil is necessarily evil. Sometimes there's that process of the transformation. Evil transforms into good or something you didn't want and transforms in the end for what is really good for you, okay? We're going to see this um, later. Okay, so it kind of like leads us into Rachel and Leah. Do you know that there is this very, and the beautiful custom to wear a veil during the chupa? And there is an explanation that the veil is there because of the fact that ya uh, Leah was covered with a veil <clears throat> and Yaakov didn't know that it wasn't Rachel. And it was, she was, he was deceived by their father, Lavan. And he did a switch between his dog. He wanted Yaakov to work for another seven years. <clears throat> and, sorry. So um, he said, so the, the custom is until now, that before the chupa, the kala is covered, and during the chupa, she's covered with a veil. So rabbis say, isn't that strange? Because the opposite, like if the veil was kind of, so to say, what deceived Yaakov from recognizing his soulmate that he wanted, so why should we wear a veil? It's a symbol of something kind of like not good that happened. So this rabbi from, uh, Miami Beach, Rabbi Friedman, his name is. I'm almost sure that it's Rabbi Friedman. And he says something very beautiful. He says, again, I'm going to go back to that message we just spoke about. He said, sometimes in life, you really want Rachel, but you get Leah. Life has a veil over it. You to everyone. Okay. Um, life has a veil over it. And, and sometimes things are hidden. And we don't always get what we want, you know? It's like, I want my kids, all my kids to be academically successful. But then I have a kid that's really not into it, you know, and drops out of high school. Or I really wanted, you know, to be rich. Or I really wanted perfect health. Or I really wanted a certain kind of life. And I didn't get that. So first of all, we have to know that in life, we might want Rachel. And I'm not, by the way, we're using Rachel and as parables it's not that Leah was some gross person. It was just not Yaakov's plan A, okay? She was plan B by default, like meaning he didn't really choose Leah. Her father chose Leah to be married to Yaakov. He deceived him. So uh, in the end, by the way, Yaakov um, loves Leah, falls in love with her. At first, she's considered the hated one. Like he's not... He's like, oh, it's feeling ripped off. Like, no, I fell in love with Rachel. I thought I was marrying Rachel and I got Leah. Out of Leah, she ends up having the six tribes. And out of them is Yehuda. Who comes out of Yehuda? Melech HaMashiach, the Messiah. Mashiach comes out of Yehuda. So she's a very important integral part in the foundation of the nation. Okay? So she's very important to him. So sometimes in life, you might get a Leah, but it's exactly what you need in order to build the nation. He actually needed Leah, even though he really wanted Rachel. The other message is sometimes in order to get Rachel, what you really want, you have to go through a process of a tikkun and have Leah, and then you end up getting Rachel. Because Yaakov did end up marrying Leah, 
which was a very big part of him, and and got buried with him, unlike Rachel that didn't get buried with him. And then he ended up also getting his choice, which was Rachel. So you have your choice and you have what is faith, what is destined to you, what is fated to you. And in life, there is that veil. That's why we have that symbol of the veil because you go into a marriage and you, we all have these pink, like rosy, like, oh, it's going to be amazing, you know? Like happily ever after. Baruch Hashem, halabai, that it should be like that. But it's very humbling message to know that in life, we're not always going to get what we want. You might get Leah. And through Leah, you'll get Rachel. Okay? And you might get Leah because that's what Hashem thinks that is good for you. You know, a lot of times people say, I really want to be rich. And when I'll be, when I have a lot of money, I'm going to be very, very content and happy and all that. And then they win this big amount of money. And this is kind of like statistics show. Doesn't bring happiness, didn't bring, and, and, and it causes friction in the family and terrible things, you know? So <clears throat> not always what you think you want is what you really need, okay? So the, the lesson of the veil, you know, is so beautiful. You might want Rachel and what you need for growth is Leah, right? And you might get Leah and get Rachel after that. Like maybe someone wanted to get married very young and they just don't find their soulmate till they're 35. But they go into a marriage that is amazing and they're much more evolved and they made a better choice than they would have made when they were 20 and dating. And they had to go through the years of Leah that they didn't choose, so to say, and end up with the Rachel, but they had to go through that process of maturing and, and whatever, why Hashem thought that they needed to stay single all that time. Maybe they come into a marriage with great appreciation and it's a tikkun for something that they did in another reincarnation or whatever. We don't know. And I, I take this for my life too. And we all went through losses in our life. I don't know why my son died. And I don't think there will ever, ever be any satisfactory answer for me. But I could always say inside my mind, above like my emotion, say, I don't understand it because I just wanted my son. Like I wanted Rachel, right? But Hashem obviously said, no, your path is a different path. This is what is fated for you. Like you, Devorah, you're going to lose him at six and a half years old. And this is kind of, your journey and your destiny. And is it something I, re, I resist, resist 100%, but, but on, a, on, a, on an above logic type of uh, sense, you know, from a more like higher evolved consciousness, I, I understand that I don't understand. And somehow this is for his tikkun and my tikkun, you know? But on a motherly level, I'm never going to be satisfied. Like I'm just not, you know, that's just kind of like a natural thing but then up here i say okay hashem, i have to accept it this is the reality of hashem this is what we call metziut haboe this is the the existence and the reality of hashem in this world so <coughs> um rachel she was very beautiful beautiful parent she, she was yifata and uh she's considered uh the bechina of a tzaddik tzaddik is like very beautiful and whole leia they say, her, her eyes were like soft. What does that mean? She looked like before I put on makeup in the morning. You know what I'm saying? Like the other day, my eyes were so red and I had to go teach in the morning. So I cut a cucumber. They, by the way, this trick really works. Cold cucumbers, you slice them and I put them in my eyes. Now I forgot to tell my husband, don't get scared. I'm walking around with it. I can't really see anything, but I'm just keeping it on my eye. And I turned to my husband, I'm asking him a question. And he's like, woo, like he like didn't expect green eyes, you know, it's like I turned into an alien. So she was her inele arakot, like they, she had cried so much. What was she crying about? Because she couldn't go to Macy's. She was crying so much because it was kind of known. It was family marrying family. And it was like, it was known like on the internet at the time, the rumor was that Yaakov is a tzaddik and Esav is Russia. And Leah was so spiritual and she was such a tzaddikist. She was like, oi. I don't want to marry a Russia, a wicked person. I want to marry a tzaddik. And she cried and cried and cried. And she was able through her tears to transform her destiny. It's amazing what tears could do. They say the gates of tears never closed. So the Kabbalists say that Rachel is Bechinat HaTzadik. 
a righteous person. And Leah is Bechinat Baal Teshuvah, a person who does Teshuva, they say is in a much higher level of a tzaddik. Okay, a guy is born FFB, he grew up, Mea Shirin, keeping Torah mitzvot all his life, it's easy for him. Whereas someone grew up in California and didn't even know they were Jewish, and they come to Judaism, or they're trying to practice Judaism in a non-Jewish world, like living in Houston, Texas, it's more challenging, you know what I'm saying? Like I live in a bubble right now, it's much easier. Um, <clears throat> so she's Bechinat Baal Teshuvah, uh, repentant, repentance of Teshuvah, which is much higher level than a tzaddik. Tzaddik is revealed, it's, oh, he's a righteous person. And Baal Teshuvah is the aspect of hidden, that she's hidden, she's more hidden. So there's the revealed and the hidden. And in life, we're going to have both forces. Like we're going to experience God in a revealed way many times. Like your mind will be blown away. You'll be like, wow. Like when I get pregnant with my son, Shabtai, two years after I lost Alicia, I was on cloud nine, super grateful for the miracle of being able to be, you know, pregnant and such an like, so to say, mature age. And like, what a blessing that it was a boy and just so comforting to us, right? And that was very revealed good. We have in life where we go through experiences where it's not revealed, right? Where things happen and they're not exactly as we want. We get Leah and we wanted Rachel. And it's hidden. It's Nistal. There's Galui and there's Nistal. Galui is revealed. Nistal is hidden. And we have to remember that Hashem is in the revealed and he's in the hidden. We have to look for him even when it's hard for us to see him. So we need both aspects within us, within our character. We have to develop, develop the Rachel in us and the Leah in us. You know, the Rachel is like the very innocent, wholesome, Sadiq, and Leah is through her tears, she's able to transform her destiny and not just her destiny, they say, because she cried so much about not marrying Asab, her tears, so to say, carried on to the next generation. And Asad, Asab ended up having descendants that became Jewish. As we said, Rabbi uh, Antoninus and Shemaiah ben Avalt uh, of Talion, all these uh, figures from the Talmud that, later, that became, you know, that converted. And they say that's because of the power of Leah. She was able to bridge the fallout of Asab and transform them and bring them back to the fold. That is the power of the <coughs> of transformation that Leah brings into the world. And, and what we said is that whatever our matrix and patriarchs went through is they went through kisiman for us, like meaning they embedded within us and etched within us the muscles that they developed. They gave it over to us later on in history and also to us as individuals, okay? So... On the negative and the positive, like I'll give you an example. I was reading the Ramban says, Sarah, she was a little bit cruel to Hagar, came from a very righteous place because she was very uh, futuristic and she knew that Yitzchak was the heir of Yaakov, of Avraham, and she couldn't have, so to say, bad internet with terrible things going on in the house. So she needed to make sure that Yitzchak was an environment that's going to uh, encourage the growth and the continuity of Avraham. So she had to get rid of Hagar. I remember, she's going out of her comfort zone because Sarah was all about kindness. She was the one who brought many people into the fold and it just wasn't working with Hagar. She was rebellious and Ishmael was rebellious. And she had to kick Hagar out. And remember, Sarah had four openings to her tent. She was all about welcoming the guests. So it was kind of really against her nature to do this. But still, the Hashem, Hashem, he judges the righteous people like, so say with a fine comb, like he really looks at them. And because of that, she was a little bit harsh with Hagar. Ishmael's descendants, so to say, got permission to be harsh with us. And that is the root of the conflict, the Palestinian Israeli conflict. That's exactly where it comes from, history, okay? But also the good things that they did, the characters that they, they developed, like Sarah went down to Mitzrayim. 
And she got afflicted by Paro, Pharaoh. Later on, Pharaoh gets afflicted by God with the 10 plagues because he afflicted Sarah. He wasn't successful in being with her, but he was success successful in torturing her and until he realized, well, I better not mess because she must not be the sister. She's the wife and there's some kind of divine protection around her. So he let her go and he let her go with much wealth. Later on in history, the Jewish people go into Egypt, down to Egypt, we become slaves there. Power gets afflicted because he afflicted Sarah and they end up leaving with great wealth. The same way Sarah and Abraham left with great wealth, they now are leaving Egypt with great wealth. So we're kind of seeing history repeat itself. So when we look at the matrix and we learn about them, it's very incredible because if we look at the positive qualities and traits that they, that they developed, it's something that we have within us and it repeats with us. So let's say you say, oh, I don't think I can handle the situation that God has brought into my life. Look at the matriarchs. How did they deal with situations? You are their daughter. You're made in their spiritual DNA. You could deal with it. You have what it takes. Okay, you have that stamina and the strength and the tools they gave us a toolbox. That's what it is, a toolbox. Really, what, what really is so special about the matrix and the matrix is they always seek God no matter what. It, what does it mean? King David says, Sheva ipol tzadik vikam, that a righteous person will fall seven times, but will get up. What does that mean? A righteous person is not always righteous. He will fall. He will stumble. He might get tempted, but he will bounce himself back up. That is what's different about it, Sadiq. Our patriarchs and our matriarchs, their main goal in life was to bring God joy, to bring God nachas, to bring God's message into the world. They were the first ones, the pioneers, in bringing God into the physical world. It wasn't like the end thing. And they said, you know what? God could be found everywhere in the mundane. You can make the mundane ordain. That was a new message and a new idea an ideology that they brought into the world is finding God in everything, everything in life, literally, even in mopping the floors. If you look at your house as a sanctuary of a house of God and the souls that you're raising in the house, so even the most mundane things in a house are very godly, okay? Um, <clears throat> so just looking through my notes, make sure that I'm going through everything, okay. So now let's look also at more qualities of Rachel and Nea. Rachel, she, her quality was silence, you know, because when the switch took place, she kept silent, you know, she didn't go to Yaakov and complain or her dad, her dad, she didn't really have a choice with her dad. He was a villain, right? Like the, it was a dictatorship, but she didn't go to Leah and say, you stole my husband, da, da, da. you know, she was silent. You know, she didn't blow the cover of what was, she went along with it. So she was gifted with silence. What an amazing quality it is sometimes to know when to be silent. Leia, what's Leia's quality? Her like main strength is Hodaya. She had a son named Yehuda, which is the name that the Jewish people get it from, Judah, Jews. In Hebrew, Yehuda is from the root letters of Toda. What is Toda? So Dias, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I hope thank I, you. Yeah, I, I got nervous because everybody was so silent. I'm like, don't be such a Rachel. It's okay to talk. <laughs> it takes a while to get off of the um, oh, mute. You, I know, no, I got nervous because um, I met, was messing around with something in the laptop and I was like, ooh, I hope I didn't mute myself. If that happens, you could always message me. Um, so she, her main quality was Hodaya, to be a, a, a person with attitude of gratitude. Like, and she, she not just, it's a, it wasn't just an attitude for her. She always literally verbally verbalized her gratefulness. And we see it with all the kids that she had. She's like, wow, now I have this son and my, he will look at me. And now Hashem heard my prayers. And now I'll thank Hashem, Yehuda. And each one of her boys, uh, name symbolized a gratefulness that she expressed. Okay, so 
We're seeing silence. We're seeing gratitude. Now we said that we have within us all the matrix because we're their daughters. And you know, today, like they have 23 and me and all kinds of like genetic testing. They take your saliva and they test you and they'll give you like a map of, oh, you're 20% Polish, 20% Spanish, you know, like they tell you where you're from. If we were to like, so to say, take a sample of our spiritual DNA, we have all the matrix within us. So meaning we have their qualities within us. <laughs> so some of us have something more dominant, some of us less dominant. Some of us could be more with Sarah. Some of us are identified more with Rachel. Some are identified more with Rivka. You know, overall, all these matriarchs, I'm focusing on the matriarchs, but also the patriarchs, their focus was to bring God into the world. They were godly people. They behaved in a godly way. <clears throat> and within us, we could always strengthen a quality that we're missing. So let's say I'm a Rachel. I'm very silent but I'm not assertive. Like I can't stand up for myself, you know? Learn from Sarah. Sarah said to him, we have to get rid of Agar. And what did God say? God said, Tishma Bekola, go listen to that woman. Avram, you gotta listen to Sarah, okay? Cause she was assertive, she was confident, okay? So maybe I need to work on my confidence. I need to bring more Sarah into my life. And I said this, it also works with relationships. You're married, let's say you're a Sarah and you're married to Yitzchak type introverted, but you're very outgoing. You're like a Sarah, you teach. And you want your husband to be like a teacher and outgoing. And he's not like that. Don't try to make an Avraham, a Yitzchak, a Yitzchak, an Avraham. You got to accept him, okay? Also works with kids, with relationships, with friends. Like you want your friend to be different, but they're not. Like it's accepting them for the strength that they have, you know? And if you want to work on yourself, that's fine. You know how like other people have 20-20 vision and how their spouse should change, their kids should change, their friends should change, their boss should change, their employees should change, but they don't have that kind of like vision about themselves, right? It's much easier for them to see it in others. So really we have homework is going back to ourself, you know, and, and fixing it within ourself, right? So, uh, Shalom Elena, how are you doing? I'm okay, I just wanted to tell you, didn't want to interrupt, my mother and I were listening from her phone, but I need to move to another area. So I needed to depart from her oh, being together. <laughs> okay, I'm happy that you're still- But we're both listening attentively. Oh, so go ahead. Thank you very much. So we're gonna, um, I'm gonna end with another topic, which was so fascinating to me. Um, it's about the tears. We spoke about the tears of Leah, right? That through her tears, she was able to transform her destiny not just her destiny, the descendants of Esav, right? And now we're going to talk about the tears of Rachel. We know about Rachel's tears. There's a lot of Midrashim. There's a song called Kol Nishma. There's a, a cry coming, and it's loud. And it's coming from Rachel, coming from Rachel. And she's crying about her kids that are going into exile. And Hashem says to her, Min i kolech mi bechi. Stop your crying because I've heard your message. I've heard your cries. And I promise you, I'm going to bring them back home. They're not gone forever. It's a lesson they need to learn. It's like putting your kids in timeout. And one parent says, oh, I don't want to do this. But the other parent says, we have to do this. We got to teach the son to be a mensch. And they're doing the timeout. <laughs> it's important, by the way, to, uh, we don't have young, like I have some little ones here, but like timeout has to be like, um, suited for the age. Like you can't put a little kid in for like a million hours if it's a, a two-year-old, uh, maybe 10 seconds, you know? So you can't be cruel about it. But send the idea, the messages, the mashal, the parable is gullus, exile is like time out. And Hashem said, Rachel, I'm so sorry to tell you, I have to send your kids into exile, but because of you, in your merit, I'm going to bring them back. What is so special about Rachel's tears? Because the Midrash tells us that all the patriarchs and the matriarchs went to God and said, God, please, please don't do this. Don't send them to exile. If you do send them to exile, make sure they come back. And Hashem wouldn't listen to any of them. But when he heard Rachel's cry, he listened to her. What, why? First of all, we know the story of what happened between, that happened with Rachel and Leah. So Rachel and Yaakov, they was like love from first sight. Can you imagine? And he had to work for her for seven years. So like, they're dating, they're like 
it's like this is different society, right? Like your parents, you don't leave your parents home till you get married. They're obviously not living together until they get married. So they're having this long drawn, so to say, like engagement and they can't be with each other. It's such torture because they love each other. And here comes the night of the wedding and she's noticing that her dad is giving the dress to her sister and she knows that there's another guy out there, Asav, and she for sure does not want to marry Asav. And she already had this like agreement with Yaakov because she always felt like she knew her dad was not a good person. His name was Lavan, which in Hebrew means white, but really meant opposite, that he was shachol. Like he made himself look like, you know, those people who are like two-faced and such tzaddikim, but on the inside, they're really evil. So Lavan made his face look like, oh, I'm so white, I'm so innocent, but really he was black. It was totally dark, you know, the dark side, Darth Vader. So <coughs> Rachel made a deal with Yaakov. She said, listen, my dad's a, not a nice guy. If he ever tries to switch us or something, I don't know if it's going to happen, but I'm going to give you signs and you'll know that that's, that's me. And uh, he's like, wow, that's a great idea. You know, I just heard this. I was just reading on the, um, on Facebook like a news item, I don't know if you saw this, of a girl who was kidnapped. It was so scary, I guess, to be like uh, sex traffic. And she saw on TikTok, there is a symbol that goes like this, no, like this. If you go like this and like this, it's a sign for I'm in trouble and there's domestic violence, something going on here. So she was kidnapped and gagged in the back of a car and she, she she put her hand against the window. She kept repeating this sign and a, mo a motorcyclist saw it and he had seen on TikTok this new sign. He called the police and he said, I think this girl's in trouble. <clears throat> and, he, and they said, follow the car and we're sending people. And lo and behold, she was kidnapped and she was gonna be in big, big trouble by a terrible criminal. And because of this sign, you know, it saved her life. So they created signs. Now, Rachel thought she was put in a situation that was very tough. She's like, should I, should I not get, should my sister go along with it? And then she's not gonna give him the sign. So she's gonna be embarrassed in front of everybody as he's walking her down the aisle. Like he's gonna notice she's not giving him the signs and it's, she's gonna be super embarrassed. So she, she was so selfless and she said, I'm gonna give her the signs. And she gives her the signs that her sister should not be embarrassed. She didn't want to do it. It wasn't her choice. She wanted to marry Yaakov, but she knew it was the right thing to do. And um, Leah marries Yaakov. But Leah always feels very, like, ripped off. And Rachel feels ripped off. Rachel, you understand Rachel, right? Why she feels ripped off. Because that was her husband-to-be. And she obviously didn't know at the time that she will be able to marry him. Like later, Levan agreed for Yaakov to work another seven years and he married her, right? And Leah is always feeling ripped off because she kind of got pushed into this, you know? And she always felt like Yaakov never really had true love for her, you know? So she felt secondary, you know? <clears throat> and then we, have, we hear this incident later on in their life, Rachel, so they would trade nights, I guess, that there would be nights that he would be with, with, the, with the matrix and with the handmaidens, handmaidens, you say? And he was supposed to be with Rachel. And Ruvain, son of Leah, is coming back from the field with the Dudaim, the mandrakes, these plants that are supposed to increase fertility. And, and uh, Rachel, she wants those Dudaim. She, she doesn't have children. Leah, at that point, already had... Uh, yeah, it's five children. So she's devastated. She's like, please, can I have some of those Dudaim? And Leah finds out that she's trying to get those Dudaim. And she comes to Rachel. And this is very puzzling. And she says to Rachel, Rachel, it's not enough. You took my husband. And now you want to take my Dudaim? You want to take those plants? And all the commentators are saying, whoa, 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 whoa. It should be reversed. Rachel didn't take her husband. She took her husband. And couldn't she have a little bit of mercy and, and uh, Rahmana's compassion on her sister who is 
barren and doesn't have any kids? You know, so what's going on here? Rachel listens to her and the first time she hears Leah's pain. She does like true to Shuva, like on the inside. She's like, oh my gosh, I never thought about my sister's side of the story. My sister is so broken and so sad because she, she really loves Yaakov and he really is not madly in love with her like he is with me. So you know what? So she answers her and she says, Lachen, she says, you're right. Lachen, he will be with you tonight. He's not meant to be with you tonight, but he's meant to be with me. But I want to give him to you. I truly, and what's happening here is unbelievable. The cosmic um, energy that's happening here is unbelievable. She says, you know what? You, Leah, are as much as a victim as I am. We're both victims of Levan. And we need to break free from his vict- from being victims of Levan. That night where that switch happened, it didn't happen by our choice. But tonight, let's do the switch. You be with Yaakov, and I will wait. You be with Yaakov because I am giving him to you. First night of the wedding, I really didn't give him to you. I didn't have a choice. Abba made the choice. Levan made the choice. But this time around, I'm giving it to you because I really love you. And I hear you, and I'm feeling your pain. And Leah was so blown away with it. Uh, she gave her Dudaim. And she goes to Yaakov. And she greets Yaakov. And she says, Yaakov. And she says a very puzzling sentence. She says, Yaakov, Yaakov. Anisecharticha. You're supposed to be with my sister Rachel tonight, but I rented you. What does that mean? Secharticha milashon yisachar. That night that she was with Yaakov, she conceived Yisachar. So, so Yisachar means, in the root, that there's two words here, Yesh Sachar. There is reward. What happened? Yaakov falls in love with Leah at that moment because he sees that she's crazy about him, that she's with him, not because dad pushed her into it or it was the night she's supposed to be with him. It was like that she fought to be with him. He realized how much she loved him. And he suddenly got filled with this great admiration and love for her. And that night, they merited to conceive Yisachar. Sachar was the learner, the Talmidei Chachamim. The teachers in Israel were the, the Yisachar. The Vulan were the ones that were the, the ones that were the Balabatim, the ones who supported those, the teachers of Israel. So the educators, the Talmidei Chachamim were Issachar. So Issachar was a very, very special tribe. And what happened that night? Something so amazing. That when the Midrash tells us that, ya, that Hashem tells Rachel, you gave the simanim, you gave those signs to your sister. And because of that, yesh sachar lepu'ulatech. And the Midrash alludes to the fact that it's not just those signs that she gave the wedding night to her sister. It was the fact that she gave up her husband out of choice and true love to her sister, out of true, true love, said, you're right. He, you deserve unconditional love and you should be with him. And what she, they did that night is so amazing. They actually fixed the first night. The first night was take, take, took place out of victimhood, out of, it wasn't their choice. It wasn't plan A. The, the second time in history, it's so amazing. When she gives her Yaakov to be with Yaakov that night, she actually go, fixes the night of the wedding. It fixes the first night. That is those simanim. It fixes those, those simanim that she gave to her kind of like, not me'achuz. She did the right thing, but it was painful. Right? This time around, the night that Leah conceives Yisachar, Hashem says, Yesh Rachel, you know what? Yesh Sachar Lepulatech. There's a reward for your, what you did. Great reward for what you did. And because of you, you know, you are considered the mother of all mothers. Rachel is considered Rachel Mevakal Banea. When, when we look at the matrix, all of them are the matrix, but Rachel is considered mother of all mothers, like of all the children, like Mamash, that even the ones that she didn't conceive and didn't bring to the world, you know, they all considered her children because it was for her tears 
and her effort and her kindness that brought the children of Israel back out of exile and saved them. Because Hashem, at some point, he was so, um, I would say, I'm going to use a word that's kind of lame, but exhausted of the Jewish people, that they had sinned over and over and over again. And they were warned, if you don't stop this kind of behavior and you don't stop with the hatred, we know that the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed because of hatred, and you don't stop with all this quarreling and, and acting like not in a non-godly way, I'm going to send you into exile. And Rachel, with her tears and her effort, why? Because that, what she did that night when she gave up Yaakov brought so much love to the world. It caused her to love Leah. It caused Leah to really love Rachel. After that, Rachel conceived because Leah truly prayed for her sister. It also caused Yaakov to fall in love with Leah. It also caused Yaakov to really admire and appreciate Rachel, right? All around, it brought this amazing cosmic energy. And that was the gift that Rachel, of, the, of Rachel's tears that she brought into the world. So when we, when we say that we are made in their spiritual DNA, we have what it takes to overcome any kind of friction, any kind of interpersonal flawed relationships that we have that we are in we could really draw on the strength from the matriarch to say what would Rachel do in this situation what would Leah do in this situation what would Abraham do what would Sarah do does it require a Sarah action right now or does this require a Rebecca action does this require Rachel or a Leah right so just be aware of your matrix and patriarchs and incorporate them into your life because they are really, literally, so to say, your toolbox. So Hashem should help us. I give us the blessing that this week we should really feel, um, and we should really, mamish feel their their love and they're holding our hands and their, their support and their presence. And I want to dedicate the learning of tonight to my dad's yard site. Tonight is my dad's yard site. He passed away 12 years ago. He was too young. He was 63 years old. And he battled a terrible battle with cancer. <laughs> and uh, Baruch Hashem, 10 years after he passed away, two years ago, we were able to publish his book that it was his life work and he didn't get to finish it because he got sick. And thank God we were able to publish the book in Hebrew. And thank God we were able to get the money together now to publish the English version of my dad's book. So we're working on it right now. And uh, tomorrow I'm going to Jerusalem to his kever, and he's buried, my son is buried next to him. So it's very, it's good. It's a very like meaningful day. And I, I like, I, in a way I thank Hashem, you know, last night I was invited <coughs> to a wedding of a high school friend of mine that I didn't see for years. And it was kind of wild because I got to see all these friends from childhood and uh, I had to push the class to Tuesday. And in a way I didn't realize it was my dad's yard site tonight, which is an, a beautiful thing for me, meaningful to me that I could dedicate the learning because that is, the biggest gift that you could give to someone who passed away is to give them continuity through doing mitzvot in this world and learning Torah in their honor. So Shabtai Halevi, Harav Shabtai Halevi, Ben Tzvi Hirsch, Zechutoy again Aleinu, may his merit protect us all. If you want to light a candle for him, that would be so meaningful and so beautiful. If you want to give tzedakah in his honor, that would be so meaningful and beautiful. And may his merit protect us all. And he should be what we call a defending angel for Am Yisrael and plead with the Almighty that exile be done with, that Mashiach should come, that we should have peace in the world, we should have serenity, we should have health, we should find cures for all diseases, and we should only experience bracha and peace. Okay, everybody. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. I'm going to post some pictures tomorrow from the cemetery. It's so beautiful where he's buried is like on the bottom of the mountain it overlooks Jerusalem. He, he never got to have like a mountain view from the, uh, where they lived. So my mother said he got it finally when he, he passed away. So he got his view, you know, and uh, it's very meaningful. He's buried next to a lot of very holy, tzaddikim, righteous people. Um, and my son is buried there. So it's going to be a meaningful day. We're going to my mom and 
we're all going to eat together and learn together. So I'm grateful because I have missed many of my dad's yurt sites. And last year, we couldn't do it because of COVID. We were in lockdown. So this Where is, is it. Where is your, the kever? My dad is buried in Harman Quot. No, I actually take it back. We went up to the caver, but we didn't go to my mom's house. Mm. So uh, we didn't like want to gather inside. Um, sure. So, Shem, like now it's like really nice. So I'm looking forward to see all my sisters and my brothers and nieces, nephews, you know. So it's going to be very meaningful. Okay, nice. everybody, take care. And Laila Tov. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. you. Thank, you Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Deborah. I will be in touch with everybody regarding next Monday. And I'm so sorry about this. I apologize. I might have a conflict with next Monday and I might have to move it again. But I, I might not. So I'll be in touch. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Devora. Thank you, Devora. Thank you. Thank you, Devora. Shalom, shalom, Lily.